century, uh, the role of literature in a number of uh, different sorts of uh, social settings. Uh, and so I think we'll, we'll begin with, uh, with this uh, so nexus. And um, so we have um, two, uh, two women and uh, one man. So I, I think it makes sense uh, to uh, have this uh, variety. So I think that probably we should start with uh, Nora, Nora uh, Bayram Yang. Uh, and uh, her topic is Beyond the Iron Ladle, Education, Gender and Economic Independence in the work of uh, Megotich Krimian Hairi. And just a little bit by way of uh, uh, biography of Nora. Uh, so she is uh, from California. She received her first graduate degree at uh, UC Irvine, and this was in the field of history. And then she moved to Armenia. She was there for four years. She worked at the Tumo Center for Creative Technologies. I'm sure that uh, most of you are aware of this uh, institution and its uh, importance. Uh, thereafter, she moved back to the US and uh, she has received her MA from Columbia University um, in Middle Eastern uh, South Asian and African Studies. Uh, and uh, there she completed a uh, thesis on the topic then of Prigotich Krivian. So largely she's going to be talking to us uh, today about some of the major aspects of her uh, MA uh, research. So without more ado, let me call you right to the podium. He is a figure who steps straight out from the Old Testament with all the fire and all the poetry. The whole character of the man would seem to have been molded upon a biblical model. Oh, oh, yeah. that, like, this is better? Yeah. Okay. He is a figure who steps straight out from the Old Testament with all the fire and all the poetry. The whole character of the man would seem to have been molded upon a biblical model. This visceral illustration written by British traveler H.F.B. Lynch in the first volume of his work, Armenia, Travels and Studies, is often cited when describing the subject, and the subject of this paper, Magadich Khrimian Hayek. While the image itself has become ac accepted as representative of who he was, one of the reasons the quote is so frequently referred to is because it accurately captures the image many Armenians have of Khrimian Hayek even today. Khrimian held both the position of patriarch and Catholicos of all Armenians, and holds a very unique spot in the Armenian national memory. That the Lynch quote, written in 1901, still resonates with contemporary Armenian audiences, demonstrates the static, albeit uh, imposing image Khrimian Haidik has come to hold. A tall, towering figure, matched in presence and legacy by a few others in modern Armenian history. As Lynch writes, Khrimian seems less a man, as much as an otherworldly beacon of mental, spiritual, and physical emancipation. However, the above mention of Khrimian was not the only mention of the clergyman in Lynch's text. In the second volume, Lynch also writes in no less eloquent terms that Khrimian's, quote, labors were directed to the education of his countrymen. Educate, educate. The girls no less than the boys may be said to have been his watchword. His personal influence and the power of the pulpit when occupied by such a preacher were thrown into the endeavor to awake those dormant feelings which few human beings, however much their spirit uh, may have been broken, are entirely without. <clears throat> Schools sprang up in abundance beneath the magic of his individuality. Tellingly, this second depiction is rarely cited, yet it is more descriptive of Khrimian's character and work. Here, Lynch connects Khrimian's power and legacy to his dedication to education. Lynch's second portrayal does not detract from Khrimian's persona, but provides it with a nuance and depth that is absent from the first. These dueling images, the one depicting an imposing messiah-like figure, bereft of complexity, yet prevalent in the national psyche, in contrast to the less familiar latter image, is symptomatic of the popular discourse which has developed around Khrimian Haidig. One does not negate the other, yet the former has been privileged over the latter. 
The legacy of Chaim Yon Heidegg is premised primarily upon what is known as the Sermon on the Sword, which was delivered in 1878 at the, uh, following the Congress of Berlin at, Berlin at the close of the Russo-Turkish War, where he exhorted the now famous imperative, Dear and blessed Armenians, villagers, when you return to the fatherland as a gift, one by one, get your friend and relative a gun. Get a gun and more guns. People, before all else, put the hope of your independence on yourself. This sermon has since been described as not only a diagnosis of the Armenian predicament, but also a prediction that produced the Armenian Revolution. The sentiment soon transformed into a rallying cry for those Armenians advocating liberation and self-reliance. Khrimyan's image and legacy have since turned into a symbol among Armenian communities. He is considered a founding father of the Armenian Party, an honorary Tashnag, and his name was often evoked in the official publication of the Armenian Secret Army for the Liberation of Armenia. Khrimyan's association with the concept of Armenians arming themselves is complex, and the fact that his legacy has largely been embodied by that doesn't negate the fact that he was an instrumental figure in the forthcoming revolutionary movement. However, what it has done is overshadow the shadow of the other multifarious ways in which he informed the Armenian communities in the Ottoman and Russian empires. One way in which he gauged his influence is through a careful analysis of Khrimyan's own writings and publications, which are numerous. Khrimyan pub uh, published a combination of nine essays and books between 1855 and 1901. During that time, he also wrote articles for, while acting as editor and publisher of two periodicals, Adzvi Vaspiragan and Adzvi Kitaruno. This study will look at two of his seminal works, Dadakhti and Danik and Babi Tornig, as well as the Adzvi Vaspiragan publication as a sampling of his literary and intellectual output. Khrimyan published Dadakhti and Danik in 1876 as a guide for the Armenian family. Drawing on extensive biblical imagery and lessons, the text offers the readers an outline of what the proper Armenian family is supposed to be, as well as advice to strengthen the family unit. Babi Gev Tornig was published in 1894 and is considered uh, Khrimyan's magnum opus. The structural format of the text involves a grandfather speaking directly to his grandson and uh, offering various pieces of advice as he, uh, as he approaches death. Its significance is often tied to Khrimyan's romanticization of Armenian peasant life and his exhortation for fellow Armenians to endure the hardships and not abandon their ancestral lands for a safer life abroad. Khrimyan understood the difficulties facing the rural population very well. Yet in Babi and Tornik, he expounded on the patriotic duty of every Armenian to stand, stay and work their land. Academics often concentrate on this nationalist call to claiming ownership of the eastern provinces in Babi and Tornik, which aligned well with the popular image of Khrimyan as a nationalist hero. Though that narrative may in fact be there, his long-term strategic plans for the Armenian provinces and his, uh, I'm sorry, though that may in fact be there, it is frequently championed at the expense of other valuable elements in the text, including his long-term strategic plans for the Armenian provinces and his thoughts on gender parity. Khrimyan began the publication of Adzvi Vaspiragan in 1855 and continued it until 1864. The journal was published with a dual purpose, to enlighten the destitute and intellectually floundering uh, Armenians of the eastern provinces, provinces and to also illuminate the Armenian elite in Istanbul about the region's dire situation. The latter effort was especially innovative. A few of Adzvi's contemporary publications included information regarding the lives of those outside the center and proximate major cities. cities. This reflected the general focus on developing the center at the expense of the periphery. And Khrimyan's focus on this periphery, his commitment to its development and to discussing matters of concern for the provincial army was unique during a time when most resources were poured into Istanbul and most of Istanbul's uh, Armenian elite were uninterested in and unaware of the world extending beyond their mi microcosm. Still, having written uh, hundreds of pages and essays and texts, and having published over 65 issues of Odyssey Vaspiragan, much of the understanding of Khrimyan's work and influence still rests on a select handful of events, omitting the other available texts written by him, which provide a more nuanced and complete image of the cleric from Bonn. This analysis leads the reader to elucidate certain themes which were pertinent to Khrimyan. Uh, three, uh, including the uh, education of peasants, women's issues, and economic development. These three issues surfaced throughout Tzadakhtin, Danik, Babigev, Tornik, and Azvi Basviragan in various capacities, and together they form not necessarily an alternative to the popular image of Khrimyan, but an additional layer. The message of the Sermon on the Sword has been interpreted as the idea that Armenians need to end their reliance on foreign intervention and place their hopes on themselves. This has come to be accepted as Khrimyan's primary message of prescription. However, because of the dominance of that sermon in popular discourse, Khrimyan's other thoughts on how to extricate the Armenians from their debilitating situation have been neglected. One of the major themes of Khrimyan's work is the emphasis he placed on education as a factor which can rejuvenate and salvage the Armenians. Within the first pages of the introduction of Babi Gev Tornik, Khrimyan posed the following question directly to his readers, asking, what is the reason why even with all the good you have, you are still left deprived? 
To this he answered, read Bhabhi Gift Honing and you will learn that the only cause is ignorance, not knowing how to read, write, count, and economize. Khalimyan frequently wrote that ignorance and lack of education were the root causes behind hardship. Though Khalimyan places emphasis on education, he did not advocate for formal education alone as the only uh, avenue to escape ignorance. In the chapter of Bhabhi Gift Honing titled The Amelioration of the State of the Villager, he extolled the intrinsic value of writing of books writing, you know, grandson, every book is its own teacher for the reader. The authors have died, but the writers remain alive. Those, there are those kinds of books that are immortal. Thousands of years can pass, and they can still speak to us. This statement achieved two goals. First, the work to instill a respect among the army and villager for a reading. As, as Khadiman's statement posited, the power of the book is a transmitter of knowledge, which needed no mediator. Secondly, and more importantly, the statement gave the average rural uh, army a degree of agency over their education. Aside from directly discussing the role and status of education in the development of the individual, many articles were themselves dedicated to educating the rural Armenian. One such example was the Desan Kairini Ashara series, which familiarized readers with different regions of the Armenian fatherland. For instance, in the first publication of 1858, Khaniman printed a piece on the monastery of Barak in Baspiragan. The article provided extensive information on the region, including weather, topography, indigenous crops, and the monastery itself. Educational efforts did not cease with this series of articles, however. For example, in the fifth issue of 1861, an article was published which gave a detailed um, yet introductory explanation of the structure and form uh, and function of the Armenian Patriarchate and the Armenian National Assembly of Istanbul. This was crucial information which the average uh, reader was unlikely unaware of. And through Khrimian's efforts, a peasant could gain rudimentary knowledge of these institutions. Examples like this abound throughout Azri Basriragan. In the third issue of 1859, an article was dedicated to the scientific explanation of earthquakes. Uh, the catalyst for this article was uh, an earthquake occurred in Erzurum, um, which led to the spread of terrible myths about what caused it, the worst result of which was that the youth believed these, these myths and decided not to learn the actual reasons for the cause of the earthquake and thus remained ignorant. Lastly, Azri took up the mantle of educating its readership by engaging in pertinent contemporary discussions. One such example was a provocative and satirical piece on the debate of whether to use Garabar, classical Armenian, or the vernacular. The article, written by Khrimian student Garakin Sirmanzians, was styled as a tongue-in-cheek conversation between Garabar and the vernacular themselves, each extolling its own virtue while insulting the other. It was a rare example of satire and humor in the publication, but more importantly, it invited the reader to participate in the national discourse and a pivotal development which was occurring at the time. Uh, so you get a better understanding, I'd like to read a short excerpt from my favorite part of the article that I will read in Armenia, but we'll have the translation on the screen. At this point in the article, Garapad and the vernacular have been sparring for a few pages, and Garapad is now responding to a vernacular's claim that it is, its time has passed. So Garapad says, Effectively saying that Garapad is the language of God, to which the vernacular replies simply, Asfats Hokitu Sabore. Another common topic of discussion in Khrimyan's work was gender. For example, throughout the Rafti and Dani, Khrimyan outlined the roles of women and men. Uh, according to Khrimyan, each had his or own duty within the family. Though Khrimyan drew sharply delineated roles for both the male and female members of the family, he also advocated for the fair treatment of women. For instance, Khrimian rebuked the idea that women were meant to be submissive and docile, writing, when the apostle ordered a woman to be docile, was it actually like that? As the people are to authority, the soldier to the commander, the slave to the master. No, it is not like that. The wife is not a subject, a soldier, or a slave. The wife is the free companion of the husband and an equal partner in every way. The belief in women's equality placed on, uh, an played an especially pertinent role in Bobby Gift Hortoning. Throughout the text, the grandfather spoke directly to the grandson alone. However, the final chapter saw a, sh a shift in narrative structure as the grandfather requested to speak to the entire village. It was there that he decided to speak of women's issue, uh, about how women are to be treated. That the grandfather requested a larger audience for this particular conversation suggested the importance he afforded the topic. He echoed the sentiment founded in Dadakhti and Indanik that women were not there to simply fulfill a use for their husbands. The the grandfather remarked, Are women not also people? Do they not have a soul and a mind? The Lord gave women to man, not just to bear children, but to be their companion and partner. Finally, the reality of Khrimian's work diverged from the popularly presented one, and that he advocated for more than liberation from external oppression, but also from self-inflicted economic oppression. 
A closer examination of his writings on economic responsibility demonstrates that Khariman championed a steady, moderate, and long-term solution to the dire situations of the, situation of the Eastern Armenians. While the portrayal of Khariman in the national narrative is often one of a passionate reactionary who encouraged drastic solutions, a probe into his work elucidates how the radical call to arms he is most known for was actually an outgrowth of, outgrowth, outgrowth of a very specific set of circumstances. Yet Khariman long voiced his support for more practical, even mundane remedies. One of the ways in which uh, this took form was his championing of measured economic process, progress as a key factor in the amelioration of the Armenian issue in the provinces. One of the dominant themes in, throughout Bobbing and Torning was that sustained work was the only way to achieve one's desired results. In one section, the grandfather told his grandson, there is nothing in nature that does not work. Any animal that moves works to secure his livelihood. Khrimyan is so often portrayed as the father of the revolutionary movement that his efforts to motivate the Armenian peasantry to take care of their land demonstrated there was a complexity to his thinking that went beyond the immediacy of the sermon. His decision to endorse the carrying ar arms was thus not a foregone reactionary decision. To the contrary, his endorsement was tempered by his belief that the peasant was still the master of his fate through lawful, traditional means. Another vital example of Khriman's commitment to financial responsibility in Bobbing and Torning was the emphasis on paying taxes. Taxation and the consequences of the later unfulfilled payment were the source of consistent difficulties for the Armenian peasant of the eastern provinces. Not fulfilling one's financial obligations was a sure way to have one's property confiscated, which would further depopulate the Armenians from their fatherland, Khariman's principal concern. Thus, paying ta taxes was instrumental to Khariman's belief system and one of, the one of the fundamental issues which he championed. Toward the end of Babi Torni, the grandfather told his grandson that the most important thing a subject people must do is pay his debts. This was Khadimian's attempt to imbue in the Armenians the urgency of paying taxes and debts on their land so as to avoid confiscation and the further depopulation of the eastern provinces. Khadimian's insistence on economic development should not be viewed within a vacuum. For him, economic emancipation uh, directly connected to mental emancipation. For instance, Khadimian employed the Armenian peasant to eschew the continued use of foreign cotton or foreign-made shoes and to instead open businesses in which to produce their own. He went on to write, start businesses to open paths for lucrative trade, for blossoming skills and professions, and cultivate uh, the remaining vast and fertile fields of our deserved fatherland. Khariman's understanding of financial stability also stemmed from his concerns regarding so societal stability. For instance, in Tarakhti Indanik, he warned young couples against taking unnecessary debt in order to finance, finance lavish weddings or for the newly adopted practice of buying a diamond ring. According to Khanimyan, the happiness this, these material items brought lasted only a, s a short while, and soon enough, the groom is obligated to leave his family and his new bride's sweet love in order to become an emigrant so that he may take care of his debt and provide for his family. Thus, fiscal responsibility was related, related not only to education and intellectual development, but also social cohesion. Gratuitous debt invited fractures within the family unit, dividing the, the newly formed family, and led to the undesirable outcome of emigration, further contributing to the depopulation of Armenians. As a public figure who was also a prolific writer, Khadimian provides a unique opportunity to consult the words he himself penned in order to better grasp the role he played in Armenian and Ottoman history. In so doing, one quickly understands that his contribution to contemporary discourse far surpasses what has been attributed to him. Khrimyan's outsized role in the development of the Armenian community in the Ottoman Empire is clear in both the national narrative and the academic accounts. However, a detailed analysis of his writing demonstrates that that dedication encompasses a significantly more diverse range of issues than is most often considered. He made vital contributions to the social and intellectual development of the Armenians by championing the importance of education as a tool for advancement and development, questioning dominant perceptions of the woman's world in Armenian society, and advocating for sustained financial responsibility and success, all of which played a renewed put, placed a renewed agency into the hands of the Armenian peasant. <clears throat> A close reading of Khrimyan's writings provides fresh insight to more than just the public musings of one of the most revered and renowned Armenian uh, figures in Armenian historiography. In fact, the implications of his work stretch far beyond Van or the cities to which his publications reach. Khrimyan's writings touch upon themes and issues which remain pivotal for coming to both a holistic and nuanced understanding of gender roles, socioeconomic tensions between the center and periphery, as well as those brewing between millets. And finally, Khadimian's writings offer a new way to understand how all of these fused together during this dynamic period in the Ottoman Empire. Khadimian's image and legacy performed a specific role in the decades following his death. 
usually as the convenient and tidy embodiment of the nationalist and revolutionary movement which was brewing in the second half of the 19th century. Kharima was undoubtedly a pivotal figure in the Armenian national narrative and the revolutionary movement that came to fruition then. Yet confining Khrimyan's historical legacy to a single speech or isolated uh, events precludes an objective study of the vast impact Khrimyan had on the development of the Armenians of the eastern provinces, the social dynamic of the Armenian Milad, and the perceived role of Milad representation within the Ottoman Empire. The current limit, uh, limited understanding of Khrimyan can only be expanded through a holistic under analysis of his work and publication. Publications. This approach removes Khrimyan as solely a character in the Armenian historiography and appropriately places him within the broader discourse of Ottoman and transnational history as a transmitter of social, political, and intellectual change, as much informed by the multifarious changes surrounding him as he shaped those around him. Thank you.